You're listening to The Big Picture with Edwin Eisendraft on WCPT 820. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, if that wasn't chilling enough, you know, we have uh, all this Donald Trump news this week from this, uh, you know, f- finding of liability, of guilt, um, and, uh, you know, beyond the preponderance of the evidence, right? Clear finding uh, in in one case to this bizarre and terrifying show he put on at CNN. And I, I wanted to talk to you about it, but I, I am just lost for words. So I asked Jill Lawrence uh, to come back. She was here a week ago, but she's so good at this. I asked her to come back to help us understand this. Hello, Jill. Hi, Edwin. Thank you. I hope I can live up to your expectations here. I, I know you I, can. I actually- <laughs> Well, I, I ran out of the room twice in the first eight minutes of the town meeting, and <laughs> it's, uh, you know, we got to find words. That's the bottom line. We really have to. Um, and as you noticed, I found some in what I wrote, but it's, you know, my view is that everyone got what they needed from that 70 minutes or so. Uh, Trump got exposure and applause and adoration. Biden got a year's worth of, um, of attack ads in an hour. Uh, CNN, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, as someone once said, is now in the news uh, for good and bad. So let's not do this again. That's my view. We don't need any more of this. Uh, you know, it, it was so reminiscent of the first debate between Trump and Biden where, where he just steamrolled. Trump just steamrolled over the moderator, over Biden, and Biden finally exploded at him. And he said, well, you shut up, man. <laughs> and, uh, I remember and, that. You know, there's like, there's nothing works. So... Uh, you know, this is the wrong format, and, uh, you know, I understand when people say, a lot of people say, we've got to put this guy in the spotlight constantly so we remember why we need to go vote against him, et cetera. We can't have this again. Um, but there are ways to do it that aren't quite so long and quite so uh, permissible for, you know, permitting him to just get in there and never be fact-checked. And it's... It is really terrifying, as you said, because it shows you that that a big chunk of Americans don't get what he's doing, that he's deliberately undermining faith in our system. And and also they don't get that perhaps it's not a great idea to have as a role model for America's youth a guy who is everything that he is and, and with more coming in terms of indictments and all this. So... You know, it's hard to keep up your spirits, and I, I just really hope that we don't do this again, that media decide, and also that the person at CNN who's the media critic doesn't get fired for saying it was a terrible spectacle that benefited no one. <laughs> Joe, I, I, I want to <laughs> explore one thing you said, because I'm not sure I agree, that um, that the people who support him, they don't see that he's a hawkster. They don't see how dangerous it is. They don't see... I think maybe they do, um, and they just hate us more. Um, I think that maybe they just want the entertainment value. And, you know, the person, not to uh, get too far ahead of ourselves here, but, you know, the person who called it right in 2019 was, was uh, Jean Carroll, E.G. Car- Carroll. She correctly said that the worse he behaves, the more thrilled and excited and loyal his supporters become. And and that's one of the reasons she didn't go public with her story for so long. I mean, there were other reasons she was afraid. You know, she knew he had the lawyers and the um, publicity instinct to destroy her if she went public. Um, And it took the Me Too movement and some some support, uh, you know, that... uh, that made her come forward, but in fact, what she said is true. Uh, it, nothing seems to. He said it himself. He could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue, and he wouldn't lose anyone, any supporters. Well, um, by now, you either have to be a newborn or have lived in, you know, some experiment underneath the deep sea, not to know this man, right? In all his flaws, in all his danger. Um, in all his ego, his fantasy world that he lives in. And I think that I think both his supporters and people like me, his detractors, fully agree about who he is. I, I just don't 
I, you know, I don't believe that people lose their sense of reality entirely. I think they just like the lie. Well, I, I think that's true, too. And I do think that, you know, the country is definitely people who know who he is and people who don't. Uh, I mean, and people who people who know he is and love him and people who know and, and, and can't stand him and think he's dangerous. Um, I do think that the, the material from this, it was kind of like a greatest hits on Fast Forward, um, will be very valuable to the Biden campaign because, you know, in 30 seconds and, and minute-long ads and little videos, they can remind people over and over again. And while some people... Uh, I'm guessing you and me are going to vote no matter what. Um, some people, you know, may think, well, I just don't have the time or, or I'm, you know, too tired or I don't have child care, whatever it is, you know, they're going to go. They're going to do it if they remember what what it's like and the chaos of it and, and the corruption of it. So, you know, I, yeah. I think it has some value there. I agree. There's tons of material there for Democrats, um, as vile as it all is. You know, I mean, the problem for us is, of course, we want to run on our accomplishments, which are many. We want to run on how the direction we want to take the government. We don't want to keep playing defense. Oh, my God, look what we have to protect ourselves from. And we want to shift to, oh, my gosh, look what we can accomplish together. But we cannot do it while while cowards like Lindsey Graham and Marco Rubio cannot find enough of his backside to lick. Um, it's it's a problem. I mean, the abortion issue is uh, one area where Democrats can really go on offense, and um, mm-hmm. and you know the uh, the gay marriage, the codification of gay marriage. I mean, I, I think there's a lot that that uh, can be done and argued. Um, it's just uh, you know, it's it's it, there's going to be a terrible problem until, as you say, some Republicans start start resisting within the party. It was interesting, you know, Chris Sununu, the governor of New Hampshire, was in that town hall audience, and he had, among the things he said was that, you know, he thought, I think he's going to run for president. He said he's leaning toward it, and the tenor of what he said about Trump certainly made that uh, seem like that was where he was headed, because he called him weak, defensive, and bitter, everything America's not looking for in leadership. I mean, he was very unequivocal about how terrible he thought it was. And the other thing, is that there's some reporting that shows that the audience was not all pro-Trump. You know, this was an audience of New Hampshire Republicans and independents, and they are not entirely Trump Republicans. Chris Noon was not a Trump Republican, although he's had some regrettable lapses, but he's he's not. And uh, so, you know, there were no. Where were the cameras that were showing the audience not cheering, not smiling, not clapping? We we didn't really get much audience reaction, but we could hear the cheers and the applause. So, you know, that right. that was a problem. And maybe it's kind of. I mean, there's, you know, that that may have given a the overwhelming impression of of support for Trump that maybe wasn't quite there. Well, it gave Trump the impression of support for Trump, for sure. (laughs) Remember, it doesn't take much of a big crowd for him to say it was the biggest crowd ever. Well, that's true. That's true. (laughs) I mean, there was a point where he said, I don't want to lie, and I just, like, burst out laughing. (laughs) Yeah. Let's Speaking of lying, or, or libelous lying, talk about the courage of Eugene Carroll and what um, what was accomplished through that that trial well the the courage of someone who's 79 years old to finally come forward and put herself in what she knows is going to be a very glaring spotlight uh, you know that that was something and knowing that Trump you know, will will destroy you, or will try to destroy you. She she's a very strong person. Her career before she met him was pr- pretty much as wild and crazy as his career. I mean, you know, she was a sort of a daredevil journalist who lived life pretty big, and um, and this was you know an encounter that she originally went into. She said because she thought it would make a great story to tell because uh, she the way the way she tells it and that the jury uh, held him liable for. He basically said he wanted, he recognized her, she recognized him, and he wanted her to help him pick up 
a present for his uh, for a friend, and then it devolved into you know in a dressing room, shoving her against the wall, etc. And so it quickly became not funny at all, and not a good story. And in fact, for years, she never she only told two people. So it's um, you know it, it's it, the, so there was her courage coming forth as an as an older woman, or we could even say an old woman, and I can say this because I'm not too far from her age, but, you know, you don't look like you used to look, and he's very obnoxious and awful about attacking women over their looks, and then there was the other woman, uh, Jessica Leeds, I think her name was, she was talking about uh, being attacked uh, on a plane by Trump, uh, and she was um, in her 80s, early 80s, and she was doing this kind of in solidarity with um, with with Eugene Carroll, and so and then there was a third woman who also who was in her fifties, I believe, and she also got up there and talked about this. And you know, people, you put yourself in his uh, sights, and he goes after you. And yep. so this is what they have to expect, and they did it anyway. And the verdict was incredibly rewarding, I think, and and just kind of a, a sense of indication for so many of the women who have who have uh, accused him of misbehaving and misconduct and assault and harassment and, and, and whatever, you know, but the thing, the thing that kind of got to me in some of the, the stories about E. Jean Carroll when she came out with her story is that she's owned a gun for forever, but she's only started keeping it loaded since 2019 when she went public. Mm. Mm. So, so I think you could not be more correct than the power of, um, than the courage these women had and the, and the power of the solidarity to do it together, um, to, to support each other through it, made it possible through these threats. I have a, a couple other takes I'm interested in, in your thoughts on. We're living in a, in a you know, time when our institutions have been failing us, but, and, and the Supreme Court high on my list. But the judiciary did its job. It listened to the evidence. It was a jury of ordinary Americans um, doing what we do, hearing the evidence and making a determination. And it didn't matter who, you know, who was charged, that he was the ex-president. They heard from his lawyers and they made a, they made a judgment. I mean, it worked the way it's supposed to work. And at a time when it's very hard to have faith in the judiciary, um, um, you know what? They did their job and they did it. And this is the second time that he and his organization have been found guilty, that they were found guilty of tax fraud to Trump organizations a couple of months ago. And and then when you think, well, in all those cases where he said the election was stolen and it went to court and he lost every one of them. I think there's something here that should give Americans confidence that they aren't helpless and alone, and that we built institutions that are still strong enough to provide justice. I think you're right, uh, but I think that Trump understands that, and he's trying to undermine those institutions, too. I mean, it was so striking that he kept talking about how you can never get a fair trial in New York or D.C., and why is that? Well, you know, a lot of the people on these juries are black because a lot of cities are black. Maybe they're Hispanic. You know, there's a lot of ethnicity in these cities, and uh, and he doesn't like it. And and he uses it to undermine juries and judges. And it's the same thing he does with elections. You know, the, the cities that he points to where there's so much fraud, allegedly, but not actually, like Philadelphia and Milwaukee and Detroit. I mean, the stories you hear about what goes on at, at those uh, polling pl- places and those vote count, um, or, you know, places is just really, it's hair-raising. You know, they're, they're just, he's hes inspired, I'm sorry, I, I know you had a great optimistic take there, but I, <laughs> I know I'm going off track here, but, you know, no, you're not. inspires people to go and, and, and act on his his uh, you know very nefarious tr- attempts to undermine faith in the system. And yeah, he's trying it every way he can. It's very depressing to me. Yeah, yep. and, I mean and, there was actually but he, but in court he's lost, 
and in elections he's lost. So the one thing we look at him and he presents as this confident, well, he's a con man and he presents it well. But what we have to remember is he's lost now, you know, three elections in a row badly. And he has lost, I don't know, 40 court cases in a row badly. And he's going to lose a bunch more. I mean, history is going to write him out as the biggest loser. I, I hope to God that you're right. I worry about the structural situation with the U.S. government. You know, I wonder, I, I worry about the Supreme Court. I worry about the Electoral College. Um, you know, I worry about the voter suppression laws that are being passed because Republicans have gerrymandered themselves into very dominating uh, power grabs in, in a lot of states. And I worry about a Supreme Court, another power grab that is Probably, illegitimate gonna, I mean, now. it's already given the go-ahead. Yep. What was illegitimate. that? Illegitimate, illegitimate Supreme Court. Well, so when I when I, when I talked before right. about the court, the judiciary holding its own, I'm even more amazed because at the very top level, they have succeeded, and he he and Mitch McConnell have succeeded in in delegitimizing the Supreme Court. It it um, it, its rulings are not based anymore in jurisprudence; they're all political, and and we now know it to be corrupt. Um, so I, I, I'm amazed at a, what a jury can still do when the very top court in the land is as corrupt as ours is now. Uh, I can't disagree with any of that. Um, mm-hmm. Occasionally, the Supreme Court will come through, occasionally. Uh, and I'm, I'm waiting to see what happens in the next couple of months. You know, they don't have much time left to uh, get all of its all of the major cases decided. We'll see if we end up, I mean, you know, who expects to have affirmative action after this term ends? I guess, I guess we won't. I, I just can't, I can't even think about this. It's too depressing. But I write, you know, I keep trying to write and, and do shows like this and uh, encourage my friends and their projects that are aimed at preserving democracy and expanding democracy. And there's people who are fighting in court, you know, all these voter suppression laws. So, so hopefully we will so, right. see. You mean, if you look at Donald Trump, you get depressed. Mm-hmm. If you look at the, I mean, Lindsey Graham led the impeachment of Bill Clinton because he had an inappropriate affair, uh, you know, with someone in the White House. He is uh, he has um, evolved into a man who wants to elect as the next president of the United States, someone who is convicted of of sexual battery, uh, was convicted, certainly um, in, in a um, civil case of sexual battery. Uh, so, so we know who these people are. There is no pretending that they have higher ground anymore. We know exactly who they are. They're power mad and they do not believe in anything. It's it's very uh, hard to imagine people who are unlike that retaking control of the Republican Party. I just don't know how they're going to get out of this hole that they've dug. I, I don't know if uh, there will be enough people who want to. I, Joe, I think you're absolutely right, which is why to go back to your Chris Sununu observation earlier, um, mm-hmm. I, I think if there are patriots left, in the Republic part, Republican Party, they need to leave it now. They need to leave it because we know what they do. We know what that party does, where it's in control, in every state where they're in control. They undermine voting rights. They undermine women. They uh, cannot give away enough guns. You know, they, there's nothing that they do that, that, that is popular with America. They do it because they have the power. So if you're if you're Sununu and you say, look, I'm a conservative, I believe there are conservative solutions to the shared problems we have as Americans, you do not have a home in that party. And to, to pretend you do gives it legitimacy. So I would say if you want if you're a conservative and you're a Republican, then stop being a fig leaf and go out and stand on your own like brave conservatives have throughout our history. 
I just don't know how you consolidate power among the people who leave. You know, I'm not sure where they go or what they form. And I, it may be that if there's some leadership, a real leadership among, you know, really dynamic people, that some of the other people will come along with it and lead instead of follow. But this is the problem. You know, it's, It'll it's take just, a while. Uh, Don't we need a left yeah. of center and a right of center party? I mean, my, my Democratic Party will go very badly astray if there isn't a right of center party as a counter because because single parties always do. I don't see any you know present evidence, but history is full of this. We need two parties that differ on their solutions to our problems, left of center, right of center. That's just not what we have anymore. We have big tent Democrat, which is a little bit left of center, depending on who you look at in the party. It's a pretty broad party. But the Republican Party is not a right of center party anymore. It's a anti-democracy party. Well, it's also a party that's bereft of ideas, or at least ideas that anyone actually considers realistic or popular or useful. And, you know, I do think that this is part of personality dynamic. There's just no one who's got the charisma, you know, or who's got the appeal. And and what are the ideas of the party? You know, yeah, what they, they want to... Uh, yeah, I mean, well, there are things... Well, how do you like have an idea when you're banning band. books? Right? Well, there is that. There is that. Or, or you know, when, you're, when your campaign pitch is that you were sent by God, I, you know, I don't know if that's going to cut it. That's not enough you know, for most people. Yeah, and, you know, I worked for years in Saudi Arabia. And, and they, they really, this was, a, they, they didn't have a legislature, really. I mean, they were beginning to. But they didn't because the laws came from God. So why have legislators? Now they had to have a judiciary to decide whether somebody broke those laws, and they needed an executive to like. First, but why have why have a legislature? We have the laws we need to come wow. from God. You know, that's exactly the response that happened after uh, the latest shooting in Allen, Texas. Uh, one of the legislators from there, one of the congressmen from there, was asked about where do you go beyond uh, hopes and prayers. And he said, we, we don't need anything because the, the, the people that think we do don't believe that God, God Almighty controls it all, uh, or something to that effect. And it was, you know, you may have seen that comment because it created a lot of backlash. I saw yeah, it, the but the ignorant fool right. who said it does not understand his own faith. And excuse me for, for crossing a line where I probably shouldn't go. But, but when you read the, the Bible, it's, you know, there, it's filled with things they're telling you to do and not do because they don't trust that, that, that just, you know, right? And that's different than in the Buddhist faith, you know, you, you go for enlightenment. And it's absolutely true. If you're enlightened, you're going to do the right thing. But what do all the people who haven't made it to enlightenment do yet? That's why we have laws. Well, I mean, we have, we have political leaders to do things, to solve problems, not to wait and, and pray. I mean, this is yeah. me talking. <laughs> Probably going right, well, So talk to I me, Jill. We, we began this conversation... Well, was, you, earlier in this conversation, we talked about sort of the um, courage of women to stand up against an incredible onslaught. Um, and this was true of Eugene Carroll, but it was also true, we now know, of some of the women who were um, uh, uh, watching the polls on Election Day, right? The, that mother and, and her daughter who were under such heat, um, Mm -hmm. And we saw them in the January 6th hearing. I just named one out of my head. But what do you, how do you explain the women who still support Trump and the Republicans? And there are plenty of them out there. How do you explain that? You know, I couldn't explain the men who support Trump. I mean, I can't explain any of it. I'm, I'm really sorry to tell you that. <laughs> That's fair. I mean, maybe fair. they, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a, it's a charisma thing. It's a domination thing, you know, for all of them. They just want the autocrat. They want the person who's going to take care of it all for them and tell them what to do. I don't understand any of it any deeper than that because, the, I mean, certainly the policy ideas, He, I mean, they talk about how he made America great. I didn't notice that. I didn't see that. 
except for the vaccine. Thank you, Donald Trump, for the vaccine, for Operation Warp Speed. But what, mm-hmm. what else? You know, I mean, what, what are we talking about here? And I, I, it's like this kind of um, mirage that they're worshipping, and I, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. Anything that would sell anyone else, and it ha- they have all these things that he's so far escaped accountability for, others have paid for uh, in jail, and, 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 and they're still getting sentenced in all kinds of things. So, I mean, I just, you know, people just don't seem to make that comparison. They don't seem to make the connection. Well, accountability is coming. It, 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 this, this was a f- almost $5 million uh, judgment. His company was fined in the, when, when they were found guilty the last time. Um, and she might think sue more him again. Seri- and she might just, just cause now to sue him again. Um, and there is, um, a- as we know, there are other legal shoes preparing to drop. Yeah. Uh, and I it's guess, you know, as summer. you say, people won't believe it. They'll argue that it isn't fair. They'll think it's rigged. But you know what? When he's, I mean, we had a corrupt governor of Illinois was on the news 24 hours a day. And people forgot him when he went to jail. You know, um, so when he's out of when he's out of the news and offline, we'll have a chance to heal. I hope you're right there. Thank you for that note of optimism. <laughs> um, thank you for agreeing to come back, uh, you know, as so quickly, because uh, it's great to talk to you. And um, at, uh, for those of you who don't, you know, n- know Jill's work, um, like go find her column on Bulwark that she wrote about this week and about this trial and all the stuff that's going on. It's one of the most sensible ways to think about or well, sensible ways to, I don't even think anybody's thought about it carefully and just to see, just to see what's in front of our eyes, which is sometimes so hard to do. Well, thank you, Edwin. All right. Um, and we'll talk again. Yes. Yes. Thanks very much. Take care. Everybody. That was Jill Lawrence. She, is a fabulous opinion writer, book author, The Art of the Political Deal, um, and uh, a joy to talk to. 